title my uh, presentation, Beginner to Expert. And I kind of want to tailor it. It's the end of the day. I'm sure you guys' uh, brains are overloaded right now. So I want to tailor it to, to whatever you guys need. I've got a ton of slides in my slide deck. It's all available on the SQL Cyber site where you can download it. But I've kind of geared my slides for something you can take home. It's kind of like a book that you can use and refer back to. And so I don't even have a demo in my and my presentation because it's, it's very boring. I have all, lots of pictures in there to kind of guide you through uh, how to set up replication, how to troubleshoot it, how to monitor it, etc. So, with that in mind, um, you know, I blog on SQL Webpedia, and, and the name kind of competes with the SQL Serverpedia, which Quest supports. So, I'm trying to change my name over to the Mission Critical SQL. Whenever I have time, I'll do that, which is about never. Uh, I even have a migration tonight at 8 p.m. that I need to get to. Um, so this year has been a busy life, so I haven't blogged that much, but or Twittered, or tweeted for that matter. Um, but that's where you can kind of find me. Um, and who I am, I've been a computer geek for a long time. I've been using database stuff in SQL Server, especially for 12 years now. Um, I was a top five finalist in the uh, Redgate Exceptional DBA Award in 2009. I'm currently the Database Operations Manager for Demand Media. And we have 13 publication servers with, with 60 subscribers over a WAN. And, you know, obviously I, I blog on my site when I can. And I tweet and answer questions as much as I can about replication and anything else. Uh, DBA related. Um, so the agenda basically is going to go end to end with replication. We've got our introduction, you know, basic concepts, then we're going to end the monitoring replication, then performance tuning replication, and then troubleshooting issues. So I was hoping to get a show of hands. How many people here have implemented replication? So about half of you have. How many of Never used it and are here to learn about it. Excellent. So it covers covers again. Perfect. Um, so to kind of give you an introduction into re replication, what typically kind of occurs in the environment is that you, you know boss comes to you. He says that he wants to get data to and fro remote sales offices. He's got data in Oracle systems. He wants to get it. In it into your SQL Server systems. You've got real-time analytics of current and past sales. Um, your finance data team wants to have some data, and then your fraud team wants to have a different set of data. And, oh, by the way, you need to come in this weekend and fill out your TPS reports. Uh, if you guys remember that, uh, that movie. Um, so the typical kind of boss question that comes in is, you know, I heard sharding is the way to go for speeding up our application. What do you think? If anybody remembers what those little devices are called, you get a book. Triples. Triples. Perfect. Uh, who was the first one? I think you were. And the awesome. episode was Trouble with Triples. Yeah. Yes. So, and the reason why I got this, but it's Triples. Triples multiply like crazy in, in this uh, Star Trek episode. That's kind of what's kind of happened in our environment. We have tons and tons of data. So your main master server has got this big bulk load of data, but you can't have everybody accessing that data at the same time on your main production server. So you've got to get that data offloaded to other servers. And that's what replication does. It does it very well, and it's very resilient, and it's quick and easy, as you see, to get it up and live and in your environment. So you kind of response back to your bosses is, you know, I can I think replication is the answer for your problems here, and I can implement it in a day. And I want to show you how to do that. So you could be the, the new buff guy there on the sun BBA here. By the way, that's a really good movie that's out right now. So, kind of simplified view of uh, replication. We've got one server that's the publisher down here. Right? This entire box is a publisher, so that's one server. It's got one publication. That publication is for this database one that has table one, column one, and column two. It does not include column three. It does not include table two. It includes all table three. 
It also has another publication of a different database in its own table one, column one, two, and three. So I've got a couple publications, and I've got a publisher, and then that data is then replicated out to subscribers. And so publication one goes to server two, and server two is called the subscriber. He's subscribing to the data, and you can see that column three and table two are not over on this side. So I get to pick and choose the data I want on the destination side. And this is an example here. This goes to server three. It's a completely different server. You can mix and match who goes uh, to where, and we'll get more details into that. But that concept there is just kind of like the newspaper deliveries. You get got a, a publisher has publications. You got a subscriber that has subscriptions. And you can have multiple subscribers to the same publication. Yes. Yes. So. Uh, this is the kind of simplified view, we're getting more complicated ones here. <coughs> so that's, that's ultimately what it is. And it basically handles all that operation for you via SQL Server jobs. So SQL Server jobs take care of all that uh, for you. So your publisher, you can have one or more publications on the server. And like I said before, you can pick and choose the data that you want to use. You can also filter the data. So you, you could say that, um, I'm going to create a publication that's dedicated for the Northeast environment of my data and have a filter on there that's just for Northeast. Um, or more realistically is that I've got uh, my active data set that I want to replicate on the inactive stuff that's like years previous, a simple bit flag that you've got in your database and you utilize it to filter out the data going to the destination. So, Kind of the warning I have in here, you can't get complex on here because that's evaluated for every single row. So you, so you don't want to get too complex in your, in your filters. So the things that you can publish. You can publish tables, store procedures, both the definition and the execution of them, which is a performance improvement. We'll get into more details about that later. Then your user-defined functions, views, index views, definitions, both in views and functions. So in your source control, it, you know, you might find it difficult to, you know, I've got my main master server and all my subscribers needing this updated store procedure, or I can include that in my uh, publication so that when I update it on my master server, that uh, DDL, you know, changing of the, the proc will go to your subscriber so that it has the latest version of that. So that's uh, kind of handy so you don't forget about doing that. It also can move over table definition changes as well. Your distributor uh, collects the data uh, changes by reading the log file from your the databases that you're publishing. And it stores the changes distribution database. You've got one distributor per publisher. And kind of the best practice is that you have a remote distributor server to offload that work from your master server. The whole kind of purpose of replication is get all the work you can off your master server. And the best way to, one of the best ways to do that is have a remote distributor uh, server. And so, on your subscriber side, you can actually pull the data, or it can be pushed out to you. And what Microsoft recommends here is that uh, if you have many subscribers, you need a pull model. So you're basically offloading all the work from your distributor onto your subscribers. Like my environment, I have 60 subscribers. I'm not going to have all that work being done by pushing it out because it's just way too much work for it to do. So you offload the work even down the chain farther. So your subscribers are doing the work when you do a pull model. And that's a subscriber. It, you know, it's receiving all the, the, the publications data. And to get that data over there, you create a snapshot, which is called an initialization of replication. That's how it all gets started. And the snapshot is basically your BCP and the data out to a share, and then the subscriber picks up the BCP data, then it creates the clustered index on there, and if you set the option to copy over non-clustered indexes, it will also apply those at that time, and when it's all done, all the data is ready to be used. And on the subscriber side, there's a lot of tweaks you can do for performance to help get the data there faster and subscribers. And we'll go over this later, and it's called agent profiles. Uh, 
So the default agent profiles kind of work for a nice slow network, you know, typical Microsoft 10 year old um, methodology, you know, got to work for the lowest common denominator. Well, you tweak these up, it'll double the uh, throughput of your uh, data. Yeah. I have a question in setting up the application using the backup. Mm -hmm. So I have two questions. One, if I use the backup to set up my subscriber, mm -hmm. will I lose the uh, flexibility of what tables I need, what columns I lose them? Um, you know, I've never mixed and match, but you, you're obviously going to restore your entire data set to the remote side. And I never try to piecemeal it down because in my scenario, I have a monstrous main master database. I don't want that going out to everywhere because it's a ridiculous amount of space. So I break it up in many different publications. You know, one goes out to the finance team, one goes out to the order processing uh, servers. So it's kind of spread out that way. But there are scenarios where you want to do a full backup and restore because you're replicating pretty much all the data. And I, pretty much, I think your answer is yes, you can do that. You can restore definitely all the database there. And then probably remove them from the Yeah, well, yeah, so you can re start your replication from a backup, but I don't think you necessarily have to replicate all the data, even though you started from a full backup. Um, it's very flexible in that respect. The second question, let's say I'm, I've taken a backup, but the main database is still in use. Mm -hmm. And if I restore it from the subscriber, obviously it's out of sync, right? Mm -hmm. So I mean, I'm, I've read it, but I've never used it, so I'm not sure yeah. if this is supported or not. I've never stored from a backup, and I, I don't remember if you need a quiesce, but remember replication reads from the log file, so it's, it makes actual entries in the log file and know where it last picked up. So if you restart a SQL server, being a publisher or the subscriber, they all know where they left off last and pick up. That's why it's so resilient. It's such a great solution is that you can try to blow up the whole environment and it pretty much <laughs> recreates itself and gets right back to where it's needed. So it, it will, it should know exactly where it left off um, by those log entries that happen. It's a real. But when, I was, when, I'm taking, when I'm taking the log file, I don't think. Publisher knows or the main database knows that I'm going to set up a replication. Right, well, but you will set up your, you need to set up replication first before you oh. do that backup oh. and, and restore point because that's what's going to make those entries in log files and knows that it's, it needs to pick up from there. So you wouldn't restore the database first and then do replication because oh. you need to redo that whole backup and restore again. Oh. So you got to set up replication. Any other questions there? Just uh, an addition. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I use it in a manufacturing environment where uh, the, the biggest benefit for us is the uh, resiliency uh, or the casually connected yeah. uh, model to where you know either end can go down, the other end continues on, yeah. and you don't interrupt operations <laughs> for changing things in the back end. Yeah, it's very resilient in that, in that fact. The only thing you have to be careful is just kind of the monitoring of it to make sure that something doesn't expire. Like if your SQL agent was offline, you didn't know about it, there's nothing really going to tell you uh, unless you have monitoring for the agents, et cetera. But let's say you, you didn't have that on, on some, you know, random uh, manufacturing plants server that, you know, some DBA was, you don't have a DBA, let's say, right? So you have to have monitoring, make sure all your subscribers are getting all that data. So because what happens is, is by default, it saves about 72 hours worth of data, estimated amount, right? And if you hit that limit, it's going to basically cancel that subscriber's thing and say you need to reinitialize that. Because what's going to happen is, is you, on your source server, your log backup won't be able to truncate or commit all those operations in your log file until that subscriber's got its data. So if you left that going for infinity, you're publisher and have the biggest log file you've ever seen. So what it does by default is, you know, it says three days. If you haven't fixed your subscriber in three days, it's going to invalidate it. You're going to have to do a reinitialize and a new snap, snapshot and get up and running. So, so three days to fix something is an awfully long time. And uh, there can be cases if you're throwing in lots of data, ever, it will never catch up. Like if replication gets really far behind, 
it, it's like almost impossible for it to, to catch up, and that's when you get to like greater than a million rows behind. Uh, on the same topic, like, is there an option in SQL Server that I can say never reactivate the subscription, mm -hmm. uh, never expire subscription, I guess. It's already two hours with one option. Mm -hmm. The second option is never expire subscriptions, I guess. Yeah. But in spite of having that option, I've seen the messages saying subscriptions have expired and stuff like that. And, mm. uh, it's and, and they have not been disconnected, services have been running fine. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes you run into security issues uh, that I've seen, but on that specific case, I don't know. You can set it to never expire, but you've got the caveat there. Your main log file for your uh, published database could get really big. Um, so there's pluses and minuses there. You just got to figure out what's best for your environment. Um, it's usually, if it's gone three days, it's best to reinitialize and kind of start all over. Hopefully, um, on your main system, uh, that won't be an issue. Because um, what happens when you do a snapshot is it's BCPing all the data out, and at the very end, it needs to kind of finalize that data and kind of make a marking point that this is where I left off. And so you're going to have blocking at that last finalization point, making sure the schema is exactly right, making sure it's got the right point in data in that time. So there's a little bit of blocking that's going to happen there. Your system is super busy. It's going to be a lot of blocking, um, if, and if you're doing a lot of tables that you can in your publications, just be wary that maybe I do this after hours kind of thing in a super busy system. Um, so the main one I'm talking about here today is called transactional replication. There's many different types, and we've got is transactional merge and snapshot, and Transactional's got a couple different types. You've got the peer-to-peer, -peer, which is an enterprise-only feature. It's kind of the next evolution of merge replication. And then the updating subscriber is just going to be deprecated in the next version of SQL. And, and that just means subscribers have ability to do updates to data. But the typical scenario is a transaction replication. We just want read-only data because you're offloading work from your master server. And the snapshot replication basically takes full snapshot point in time, you do that like once a day kind of thing to get the, the data updated to data warehouse so it doesn't need real time information. The transactional tries, you know, defaults like every five seconds, sees what data needs to be sent out to the subscriber and tries to get that data there as fast as it can. And in our environment, um, we do uh, DNS data, so we have domain names on our platform and someone makes an update to a domain name three seconds, two seconds, it's updated in all our data centers in the United States. So it's, it's super fast. I have a simple question. What's the difference between this and uh, integration services all DTM? So this does all the work for you. It's, it sets up all the jobs. You just, you're clicking little boxes in a nice wizard-driven environment uh, to get it the data over there, and it does it real time. So you're not on an, an ETL package, you'd be like, I need to execute it every hour, let's say, or live every half hour. Well, this thing's running every five seconds, right? And that's exactly where it left off. Where an ETL, you have to kind of tell it where it left off, or write a query that kind of figures out and, and compares the data. <laughs> it doesn't need to do that, it doesn't have any of that overhead. It knows exactly where it left off in the log file. It's the data that's needed is in the distributor, and it just is trying to apply that data there. So it's very fast and performant because of that. You know, there are cases that you want to use ETL, and those cases, I think, are big data sets that you need to kind of move. <coughs> Replication isn't good for lots and lots of data. Um, and lots and lots of data is kind of who knows how much it is. It's, it's usually, it's, it depends based on the server performance and your architecture of your entire environment. But if you're talking millions of rows that you need to update every hour, it's probably best to go to an ETL solution. <laughs> so there's limits to the replication can get you. And once you put, put past those limits, ETL is kind of really the only way. Or log shipping or some other solution uh, similar to that. I mean, well, ETL is not like it says the ultimate, but I guess when you, well, you have your three database, which looks this way, and your warehouse looks that way. 
So you want to transform data, that's what the T stands for. Mm -hmm. You can make some like yes. you can make some some some, some, some location with the name of the replication, but really if you want to do sort of change the ground, that's yeah. So that they they gave you different so all those say are some network scenarios. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, kind of really what he's talking about is in replication, I'm moving your data exactly as it is in the source of the destination. There's no transformation that's going to happen to your data. So, if you need to do that transformation, you can still replication and get it over there and then transform it and then um, redo it. We even have a center in our environment where we do that kind of thing. It's where we take the data, move it to kind of a, a denormalized database, and that our processes take that replication data and create a denormalized data, create an index view over that, publish that out as a table to our subscribers. So we've got this big long chain to get the data out there. But the end result is, is that denormalized data was 10 tables joined together, which horrible performance if you tried to do that just directly. So we just did it through an index view to get to the subscribers. And now the subscribers are looking at data and they're just doing a single join against this big denormalized data so it saves a uh, ton of time there. So there's a lot of flexibility in there uh, with replication to get basically get your data from A to B and then utilizing your processes against that B server. So if you look at this kind of picture here, is you got your, your publisher server here, your remote distributor and then your subscribers out here and you have your web servers. They're hitting a Load balancer. It's got a bit name like you know, like Reader DB, <coughs> and it load balances against your three servers here, and then your um, power users, you know, developers or whatnot. You either point them to Reader DB or you point them to the subscriber. What, whatever makes sense for your environment. But the kind of idea here is that uh, if, you know. Even Microsoft has got load balancing on the server products if you can't afford a network load balancer. Um, but the whole idea is these subscribers are now doing all the work that the publisher used to do in the, in the past. So there's uh, this big uh, SQL edition capability map that Microsoft has. I simplified it down a bunch, and I probably could have even simplified it more because it's Express and it. Express Advanced are exactly the same here. But basically, I just wanted to point out the enterprise features are the peer-to-peer -to -peer transactional application, and then working with Oracle uh, uh, publishing. And then your lower versions, you know, the free stuff, you can basically only be a subscriber. But that's kind of cool in like a manufacturing uh, plant. I just, I got a small data set I need to get out there, or small little um, point of sale systems. You can have free version of SQL getting that data, so that's that's, that's pretty cool that you can you can do that. But your typical is the you know, standard on your subscribers. So I wanted to get into replication. Do you have a question? Um, the only difference I've seen so far is that if you create stuff in 2012, you have to use the 2012 tools. You can't use 2008 R2 or whatever, those tools, they start throwing up error messages saying you can't do this and can't do that. So if you use the 2012 tools, you don't have any issues. I don't think they've added any feature improvements, but I haven't looked hard enough to see if they've added anything to it. You could probably think of as the BI and enterprise are probably the same. Um, basically, replication is available on all editions, right? And I'm not sure if peer to peer is available on the BI edition. I would doubt it because it's not, peer to peer isn't really a BI feature, it's an enterprise feature. Microsoft wants their money and they're going to get it. Right. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Can your subscriber? Or your distributor be in the cloud, and your source be uh, the distribution database is a system level database, so probably not because Microsoft isn't going to open their system level databases in the cloud. You can't change that fact, and that's one of the downsides of replication is that distributor database is a system level database, and all of Microsoft solutions don't have a disaster recovery model for 
system level databases, you've got to come up with another uh, solution. But what we're doing in my environment tonight, in fact, we're moving our main servers to do the distribution. We're using a product called Double Take and it's basically cloning all our databases, including system database, because it doesn't care if it's a system or not, and it clones it over to the other server. So you have to keep that one caveat in mind. So subscriber, probably, publisher, that's maybe, <laughs> but I've never tried it. Good question, Bob. Okay, so this is setting up replication. So the prerequisites is, you know, in SQL 2008, it's the actual checkbox to make sure uh, or, uh, an installation component. So if you actually went through in, in uh, 2008 plus client, they try to configure uh, distribution. So all you do is you connect to your server, expand out replication, you right click on the local publication and say configure distribution. The very first step you do is you gotta get a uh, distributor in your environment. If you hit this error, it's just this tiny little checkbox you may or may not have noticed on your setup. Just gonna go back into setup, check that box really quick. And then and then you just say and the next window that comes up is the distributor setup here. So you just say that this server is a distributor, that's the first checkbox. If you've already set up a an, a distributor, the second option is what you choose, and then you connect to that uh, distributor at that point. But since we don't have one environment, you gotta create one first. Like I said before, you know, in a small environment, you can have the publisher and distributor on the same server. Um, it's just when you start having multiple publications, many subscribers, definitely as quick as you can, get it off onto the remote server. And it will create a distribution database uh, on, that, on that server. And, you know, default when you create a database is whatever your default set on that database. If you haven't changed anything, it's like one megabyte with one megabyte growth. It's ridiculous. Um, if you want a big environment, my, my default is 10 gigs size, um, but I've got a big environment. And 10 gigs in the scheme of things isn't, isn't that big of a database. Um, so then you need to enable your publications. Um, it's kind of like a security kind of thing here, I guess. Um, but basically, you right click in on uh, replication, click on the publisher properties, and the server that you want to be a publisher. This can be a completely different server than your distributor, um, like we talked about. So you just check the little box next to transactional merge based on which one you want. And then the next step is you know which kind do you want? Do you want the snapshot, transactional, or merge share? So we'll pick the transactional publication. And we're just creating a, a new publication here. And like we talked about before, you know, we'll select the tables that you want, but you can come down here and uncheck um, columns as you don't need on the destination side. You know, like a unique identifier is this big, col uh, big column, well, I didn't really need it in the destination, so definitely don't send it out there. And uh, the kind of caveat, you know, you have to have a primary key. Um, that's how replication knows that, you know, source and destination are in sync is because that primary key so the unique value tells it there. So if you don't have one, you're going to have this little red X to the table. You see the little red X to the table, it means you can't select it, but you're missing your primary key. So you need to add one. And now once you have all your articles checked and you notice there's table store procedures views in here that you can expand like we talked about that's capable of doing. So you can set the properties of these and there's a lot of different uh, items that you can set and I think I got a window here that has all of them. But you can do things like copy over the non-clustered indexes, um, copy triggers, you know, all kinds of good stuff. So go through those. Um, you can decide to have non-clustered indexes copied over. You know, the typical scenario th that we have is that we, we use that as a starting point to copy over the same uh, the publisher and the subscriber the same indexes. And then we kind of evaluate in the, on the subscriber side, are we using those indexes? Um, are there missing indexes, right? So you're going back to DBA 101, is, is it indexed properly for the use of that server and that table, right? So I use it as a starting point. 
and then I tweak it with before and after scripts. So in replication, I can say that before I uh, 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 apply this data, I can do run a T SQL script, save it in the file, you tell it to go to there, and then after. So pre and post snapshot, I can have a script that runs. And so what I'll do is in my post scripts, I'll create a whole bunch of SQL statements that are creating indexes. Does this index exist? Uh, if no, I create the index. So I, I on these post scripts I run, they create all my extra indexes because typically in the subscriber side, you want faster queries and you're not too worried about having too many indexes like you are in your master server. So I can quote unquote not over index as needed. And then the next uh, uh, window in the wizard is uh, to create filters, and like I said mm -hmm. before, it's it's they're simple filters is all you can really create, but try to keep them uh, simple there. And then you have to select a security model, <coughs> and the, the account that uh, this runs on needs is a DB owner to the published database. Um, so this is where they they have this little warning here. That this is not recommended security best practice to use a SQL Server agents running on. It's because that it's got to be DBO on the, on the published database. But if you have a trusted SQL Server account and password and that's managed properly, I don't see really an issue there. The other method is um, you, to specify the account to use. And also when you're connecting to the publisher, you can create your own uh, SQL authentication account for, for it to use. There's some uh, options there. Typically, it's just easiest to run under a SQL agent account. And then you just kick off the, the snapshot job. And the easiest way to do this is use a replication monitor, which I'll get into next. But um, So it's going to go create those BCP files that go out to the share that you've uh, created and specified when you're setting up your distributor. Uh, so you have a, a share on your distributor server that stores all these BCP files. And it just starts applying them, and you can see in the snapshot that, you know, it, I've dumped out four percent of the data, and it's bulking out at a hundred thousand rows at a time from this domain expiration table, and it's part twenty-four thirty-one because I've told it to, to batch out the BCP instead of doing one massive batch. I told it to do uh, batches of a hundred thousand. Um, and that's all there is to it. Once it's applied, the, the snap, once the snapshot's done, the subscriber's job that, that's called the distribution agent, the job starts up and it's, it's already started after you've created it, and it's constantly looking for the snapshot job. Is it available? Is it ready? Is it ready? Is it ready? So you might get some error messages from that um, if it's already kicked off. And then once it's ready, it starts applying all those BCP files creating your clustered index and then creating non-clustered as needed and running your um, post snapshot uh, scripts there. And then it is ready to use. That's pretty much all there is. Any questions? Yeah? So you talked about <coughs> taking your, your clients, right, that are going up in your subscription and having some recovery operation, like back up and store kind of the thing. Mm -hmm. so No, what happens with replication is that anything gets stale or you de delete a subscription, it leaves everything as is on the server how it was. It doesn't delete anything, doesn't drop the tables, doesn't truncate. It just leaves it all stale. It's, you now just have stale data sitting out there and you can leave it that way, which seems kind of weird, but there could be scenarios for that. Or you reinitialize that one subscriber so what you do is you, in replication monitor, we'll, we'll see this. You just say, I want to reinitialize this one subscriber. It creates a new snapshot of all your data and reapplies it to that one subscriber and you get refreshed up to date. Now if you're in a load balancing scenario, that can cause an outage. So take that server out of the load balancer's active pool set, apply that data to that subscriber, make sure everything's done and indexes are applied and it's now uh, caught up 
because you know when you create a snapshot, if you're adding data to it, it's going to have a queue of, of work to do to get the data that just hasn't arrived there yet because you had that point in time that snapshot happened. If you add data, now it's going to catch up. So you apply all the indexes, now it's going to start catching up in that queue. You know, replication monitor is really good. It shows you all the information, you know, how, how many rows still need to apply to it. And so you monitor that so it gets down at a reasonable level, like zero or 100 or whatever your, your case may be. And then you add it back in your load balancer. Uh, so it's, it's basically is you're, you're reinitializing the subscriber when it gets all quirky. And it happens, but not that often. Any other questions? Increase that size of your kind of blob data max size. So the kind of default I think is 4K uh, or something like that, and you just need to run a simple command to increase that size to something bigger. Um, and in my environment, this happened a few times, so we keep increasing it, and we I think ours is up to you know like 500 megs now. So did I keep you from even getting the data in the first place? To the subscriber, seven? yes. It's completely blocked until you fix that but issue. To the, uh, publish, to the uh, database that has the data going well, but it, what's going to happen in the publisher is it, it shouldn't block any operations from you happening in there. What it is, the log file just can't commit all those operations because it, the subscriber is holding everything up. So I think the problem is more on the log file side, the side there, than you being able to update the data on the publisher. I guess I'm confused how that system setting gets used. Yeah, it's basically Microsoft's infinite wisdom is I think they've optimized it for a particular size of data that gets to the destination side. And so it's a configurable value. So it, it sees that it's hit that boundary window. And I'm not, I honestly don't know what's the purpose of this boundary window. Um, and it basically stops that transaction from getting over to the other side. And all of replication is basically blocked for that publication until you increase that size or you tell it to skip that row, which you can do. And, and later on, I've got to, we have time um, how to skip a row. If you run in that situation, you don't care about that row. Destination has a trigger that creates that particular road going over. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Let's get that to um, <coughs> filter would probably be the best way to do it. I don't think, because when you write to the table, if it gets to the table, it's going to be log file, it's going to get to your, your subscriber. So I don't think you can, unless your trigger is preventing the write to the table. If that happens, yeah, it's not going to end up in the log file, therefore it's not going to get in, up into replication. Yeah. 